Gracious and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We're so grateful for this opportunity. You've allowed us to come into the house of worship one more time. You've allowed us to come and have an opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. And no matter what we went through yesterday, no matter what we went through last week, no matter what we went through last month, in this moment, we give you our very best praise. Because it could have been the other way. Someone started out September and didn't make it to October. But you saw fit to allow us to be one that made it into this month. We thank you for life, health, and strength. God, some of us, we didn't get a promotion last week and we didn't get married last week, but we kept our life, life health, and strength. We're still in our right mind, and for that, we thank you. And so now, God, you've allowed us to come to hear a word that you have designed for our lives. God, you've prepared me to preach. You've prepared them to hear. We trust you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Can we thank God? Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is where we'll begin today. After we get to our scriptures today, if you all could be so kind uh, to share our, uh, our broadcast today on um, Facebook, that would be a tremendous blessing. Um, it's my belief that someone wanted to come to church today and, and they couldn't. So let's share this word with them. On any, even, any given Sunday, we have a few hundred people here that attend our services and we have about 1,200 that attend online. Amen. So uh, you all are part of that. So make sure that you ensure that someone hears the word of God digitally if they cannot be here in person. Have you all found Romans chapter 12 yet? Yes. Romans chapter 12. Uh, I want you to bookmark that, and then I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 4, and then bookmark that and go to 2 Timothy. Romans chapter 12, verse number 3 through 10. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 10. And 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 6. I want you all to take great notes today. I think we're going to have a good time of impartation and teaching. Romans chapter 12, verse number 3. If you haven't found it, look towards your screen. The Bible says this. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man in the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry. Let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring, say preferring, preferring one another. Now let's go down to first Peter four and ten and it says this it says as every man hath received the gift even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God now let's go to second Timothy second Timothy chapter one Verse number six. If 
you don't have it yet, look toward the screen. It says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift. Say, stir up the gift. Stir up the gift, stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. The word of the Lord is blessed. Uh, before, I, before you take your seats, won't you announce my subject and my thought for today to someone? Tell them, shake well. For best, for best results. You may take your seat. Right. We have been dealing in this series for uh, the past five or six weeks or so, uh, and we've been dealing with uh, this thought uh, that we're all called to serve. We all have an assignment uh, from God to serve. It is not just those who preach that are called. All of us are called to serve. For the Bible tells us many are called, but few are chosen. And so we come and we begin to discuss that all of us in this path of uh, uh, finding our gifts and finding our calling, we have each of us a giant to kill. Say a giant to kill a grace to walk in, say a grace to walk in, and a gift to make the world better. Say that with me. Amen. And so uh, we all have these three things in common, and uh, we've learned that uh, outside of having uh, the giant to kill, the next thing is that we begin to walk in grace. Uh, and it's so uh, important that we understand uh, that when we walk in grace, we must understand that there are many uh, expressions of grace. One is uh, obviously the mercy, the unmerited favor of God. Uh, and then the other expression is the ability of God. God can give you supernatural ability or grace. Uh, and so we know that in the fivefold, there are many uh, graces or expressions uh, of gifts. We have uh, the apostle. We know the apostle is the builder or the visionary. Uh, if you have visionary gifts, if you have an entrepreneurial spirit, if you like to start things, if you're the type of person that can walk into uh, uh, an empty place, and you can begin to just see things happen. You can you can see the daycare. You can you can see the shopping center, or you can you can see the ministry out of nothing. That's typically an entrepreneurial spirit, which is connected uh, to a builder's grace or an apostolic grace. Apostles go into regions and plant. They begin to uh, start works from nothing. They can go into nothing and create something. That's their grace. That's their ability. That's what God is giving them that's supernatural in its understanding. Y'all got that? And then we have the pastor, the pastoral gift. Uh, the pastor, uh, for many of us, we have believed, especially in the Western church, that the pastor is primarily the one that leads the church and the one uh, that ultimately preaches on Sunday. And, and, and for some instances, it is just that. But also the grace of a pastor is one that has a very unique compassion for people. A pastor uh, is not just one that loves preaching. A a pastor genuinely loves people. Uh, a, a pastor uh, is the type of person that leaves the 99 and goes after the one. Amen. Uh, a pastor is one that sits down with people and, and although their life may be hectic and it may be busy and it may be all types of things going on, a true shepherd's heart will not be able to just ignore a shepherd. A, a, a true shepherd's heart will ne not be able to ignore a sheep. I'm sorry. A true shepherd uh, is always uh, turned their hearts toward the people. And I'll pause right there. If you, if you ever considered starting a church, please don't do it if you don't love people. Uh, please don't do it because it, it, it takes the grace of, again, loving people, being compassionate, and being the type of person that ultimately gets in there with you and disciples with you and works with you. Is that okay? 
And then we have the prophetic grace. The prophetic grace, uh, for some of you, it, it, it typically is connected to creativity, revelation. Uh, you are similar to an apostle, but you're not an apostle. Uh, and by that, I mean that just like the, the, the apostle has the ability to see vision, uh, the prophetic is often operating in that same gifting, but it's through hearing. All right. The apostle can see and then but however, the, the prophetic can hear, can hear things that are uncommon, can hear and can hear from God at a very high frequency. Does that make sense so far? And they can begin to get revelation where others don't get revelation. They can hear behind the scriptures. They can kind of they can hear things that, that that God is saying that is not privy to the average person. Does that make sense? And then we have the evangelist. That's, the, that's the, the outreach person. That's the marketing person. That's the gatherer. That's the, that's, the, that's the extroverted personality that goes out and is willing to share the gospel. Evangelists aren't shy people. They, they have a boldness about them, and they're willing to go out and spread the gospel. They are willing to go in, into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in. That's the evangelist. And then the teacher is the administrator. This is the person that has extreme organization skills. They are trainers, they're teachers, they're facilitators, they're people who know how to connect the dots and put all these things together. I tell you, an apostle is no good by himself. An apostle is no good by herself. You can see all the vision you want, but if you don't have any hands to help, you're going to be coming up short. You, you, can, you, can be all, you can be the prophetic all you want all day long, but if you have the prophetic with no order it's just going to be chaos you, you, can, you, can be, you can be a pastor all you want but if you don't have any evangelists you're going to be preaching to yourself you, 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 if you don't have any gatherers any people that will go out and win souls and bring people in you will not have anybody to go chase after am I making sense so far and so we all need each other say together we have to do this together. And so I started this teaching, uh, I started this teaching explaining to you what these gifts and what these graces were. And then I spent the next four weeks teaching on growth and maturity. Now, if you're paying attention, you realize why did he spend so much more time talking about growth and maturity than he did actually talking about the grace or the gift. I've spent the last four weeks teaching you and talking to you about growing up in yourself, building your spirit and building your character. And we only have spent one week talking about your actual gift. Because here's what I've learned. Here's what I've learned over the years of being in the kingdom of God is that the truth of the matter is that if you have grace or you have gifting with no maturity, it is a complete waste. And here's why. Because I found that your gift only works when you get your way. Gifting without maturity is a waste because your gift only works when you get your way. Your gift only works when we agree with you. Your gift only works, watch this, I'll take it a step further. Your gift only works with people just like you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gifting grace with no maturity is a waste. Because again, the moment that you disagree or the moment that you are offended, your gift shuts down. All of a sudden, you're no longer feeling it. All of a sudden, you begin to get inconsistent. All of a sudden, we don't see you as much as we used to. 
All of a sudden, things don't seem to flow and seem, things don't seem to go well for you. And then all of a sudden, you just feel disconnected. And then go from disconnected to ultimately just severing all together. Somebody shout maturity. And so the reality is, uh, is that we need gifts uh, that can endure the tension of disagreement. We need gifts that can endure the tension of disagreement. Can we disagree and then use that same gift to allow maturity to kick in and begin to work through what we need to work through so that we ultimately can continue serving? Yeah, many times we ultimately shut down with our gifted selves. Our gifted selves. Powerful. But will shut down the minute that diversity confronts you. Because maturity will require you to understand, as the scripture states, to not think more highly of yourself than you ought. Because we have a group now uh, uh, that, 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 that love teaching and they love this and this and that. And then we have, and, and it's just like, I believe God is in heaven saying this is just a body full of arms. And then we have the prophetic types and all they care about is prophecy and all they want to do is prophesy and all they want to do is cast out demons. And I believe God is saying that's just a body full of legs. You can only function in an environment that's just like you. But that's not what a body is. A body is diverse. I've got arms that serve a function. I've got legs that serve a function. I've got a head that serves a function. And the reality is, is that I've spent the last four weeks talking about growth and maturity is because we are responsible to not just be gifted. We are responsible to mature and work together as the joints supply. Is this making sense to anyone? And so I, I, when I, I do a lot, most of you know this, but I do a lot of traveling and, and I do a lot of teaching with 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 uh, with leaders and et cetera, and I, a lot of times I tell them if I if there's anything that I could give the body of Christ, uh, if I could deposit one thing in, in the body of Christ, it would be mediation rooms. Uh, what's a mediation room, Pastor Jay? A mediation room is is a room at the back of the church um, that all of y'all that are offended with each other and got issues with each other, before you can serve, you got to go in the mediation room. And we're going to lock the door behind you. And we gonna, you got to sit in the mediation room with all of your anointing and all your gift and all your power. And y'all sit in there and talk it out and work it out like you got the real Holy Ghost. And when, you, when it's healed and when you're on one accord and when your heart is right, and when, are y'all hearing me? Then you can come out of the mediation room. But don't get on the drums. Don't get on the door. Don't get, in, don't get this microphone until you go in there and get it right. Don't go in the parking lot. Don't go nowhere. Don't do nothing. And this is going to really make you mad. And then after you do the practical, then go pray. So y'all didn't like that. Y'all didn't like that because y'all think prayer fixes everything. You can pray all night and then don't do the practical. What good did it do you? Do the practical. 
Do what you can do. And then God will do what he can do. Somebody shout amen if I'm okay. And so then we get to our feature text today that says that we have to stir up the gifts. Just tell your neighbor, say stir up the gifts. Tell somebody else, say stir up the gifts. And so um, it's our responsibility, we understand, through the text today, to stir up the gifts. Now let's read it one more time. Uh, and I'm going to move out your way. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse number 6. It said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Say stir up. Say shake well for best results. Now any of you all have ever um, had a jar or a glass of orange juice or some type of organic material you'll know that sometimes the pulp or the uh, uh, parts of the ingredients will settle to the bottom. And then medicine does the same thing. And you'll notice if you read the instruction or you read the label, it'll oftentimes say, shake well for best results. And why does it say that? It tells us to shake well because it knows that sometimes the parts get separated. And once the parts get separated, it's not at its maximum potential. It doesn't taste the same. It doesn't have the same value or nutritional value if the parts get separated. So the label says to shake well for best results. Blend for best results. Come together for best results. Tell your neighbor, say shake well for best results. Now watch this, y'all. I'm going to make this real churchy and real deep. Okay, because for something to stir, it must have agreement. For something to stir, the parts must yield to each other. One part cannot be stubborn with the other part. It takes compromise come on somebody today good God almighty if we're going to stir up our gifts it means that although I'm a part and my gift is vital and my gift is important my gift is not doesn't have its best results until I yield to another part and so somebody shout agreement yeah if for the parts to come together, they must agree. They must yield. Romans 12 and 10. Let's look at it real quick. Romans 12 and 10. Romans 12 and 10. Here's what it says. It says, being kindly affectioned one to another. Tell your neighbor, say, be kind. That's why our mission is very simple. Show kindness. It's not a marketing gimmick. It's scripture. If you read throughout scripture, you will find a theme of unity and kindness. It doesn't matter how many giftings or how many uh, strengths and how, many, how much grace you're walking in. If you cannot be kindly affectioned one to another, then you won't get your best results. Am I making sense so far? And it says, in honor, preferring one another. Now, We've gotten real good in the body of Christ of saying, I love you, but I don't necessarily got to like you. And then if we take it a step further, it's, I'll work with you, but I don't prefer you. I, I'll work with you because I have to. I'll 
be on the team because I have to. I see y'all need help. I might as well help since I can. So I'll help you, but I don't prefer you. That's not scripture, y'all. That's not the way God intended for us to work together. God said we should prefer one another. Now, how do we get to preferring one another? I'm telling you, y'all, we have to be mature. We have to grow up. Because it's so easy to not prefer you. It's so easy. It takes maturity. Say maturity. To learn how to prefer imperfect people. To prefer the diversity of gifts in the body. To prefer. Say prefer. And the reason why we have to mature and we have to grow to this place is because Although we're different, we're part of the same body. And that's where we have to find our commonality, is that we're part of the same body. There's be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. And so, y'all know, uh, whether it's... uh, uh, juice or whether it's a soup or whether it's any type of concoction that allows uh, the parts to begin to separate over time. Y'all know? Um, The reality is is that all of those parts although one may seem uh, to be more enjoyable than others to others, at some point they have to continue to stir each other up. Am I making sense so far? My, my mom used to make this soup and uh, there were certain parts of the soup I liked better than the others. You know, she just throw everything in there. You know? And so I didn't like the lima beans. I didn't like lima beans, so I pushed them to the side. Um, but I liked the macaroni and I liked the beef. And I liked some of the other things that she put in it. But there were some parts I didn't like. But in order for the parts that I liked to get the flavor that it needed, the parts I didn't like had to be in I'm Man, I'm teaching. Because it all working together seasons. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and so while I may not like the llama beans, they're serving a purpose. <laughs> so it's working all together and and so a lot of times what we'll do can I have a few more minutes a lot of times what we'll do is we'll take the lima beans out before we start preparing because we say I don't like lima beans so we just take them out and we don't include them. But you don't realize that by taking them out, you're diminishing the potency of the finished product. Is this making sense to anybody? I had a conversation, I had a beautiful exchange this week with with one of our leaders and um, in this exchange we had a difference in opinion and it was an opportunity for this to either go really well or go really bad are y'all hearing me so far and we began to talk it out and we began to exchange and go back and forth and back and forth and, the, and they're telling me, well, this is how I see it. And I'm telling them, well, this is how I see it. And we're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. 
And ultimately, um, we ended the conversation. That person's phone died. So that leaves your mind to wonder, well, how is this going? <laughs> right? But the person reached back out to me maybe a few hours later and said, you know, I thank you for sharing what you shared with me. And I thank you for being honest with me. And I thank you for making me better. Amen. Now, it takes maturity. Because here's what I said. Watch this, y'all. This is going to rock your world. I said, thank you for giving me permission to pastor you. Thank you for giving me the room to speak into your life. Because every time you speak into a person's life, they don't have to receive it. They can get offended. They can throw the lima beans out. And they say, this is not a part of my destiny. This is not a part of what I'm trying to do. Is this making sense to anybody? Last point, and I'm done. Let y'all go home. I'm going to enjoy my birthday. The last thing is temperature. Say temperature. Go with me to Revelation 3 and 16. Revelation 3 and 16. It says, so then because thou art lukewarm, say lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will do what? Spew thee out of my mouth. Now, here's what's so important about stirring something. Temperature is important. You'll notice, I don't know, how many of y'all ever made sweet tea, Kool-Aid, something like that? Now, you know that if the water is cold, it doesn't stir well. Y'all know that, right? Because sugar one of the parts will not dissolve if the temperature's not right. But if the water is hot, one of the parts will dissolve and it will allow the ingredients to stir properly. Y'all getting this? And so it's very important it's very important that you understand how to maintain, watch this, the temperature of unity. I can, within a few seconds, identify the temperature of unity in a ministry. It doesn't take long. It doesn't take long. You can feel it. If you have any type of sensitivity, you can feel when a ministry is unified, when, a, when, it's, when it's hot, and you can feel it when it's cold. Are y'all hearing me today? And so my charge to you, my charge to you as a church uh, is to not just be a thermometer, but to be a thermostat. For you all to make up in your minds every week that we're going to set the temperature of unity in this house. It's not going well. Things are going. Somebody mad at somebody. This, 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 this. Set the temperature. Adjust it. it don't, it's, it's nippy in here. Adjust it. Y'all ain't catching me today. It's nippy in here. It, it, it's, it's a little chilly in here. I feel a little, it's a little brisk. Adjust the temperature. Go hug somebody. Tell them you love them. Tell them you're sorry. Whatever. Tell them something to get because the reality is, is when it's too cold in here, the ingredients don't mix. 